a lot of me, so from this is my opinion, also my experience has been you have so, uh, physical sobriety, you have emotional sobriety, then you have spiritual sobriety. The emotional sobriety, I've just started to get in touch of what emotions and how I really operate in real time. The answer to the way out of that is through spiritual sobriety. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Hola, compadres, and greetings from Studio AA, deep in the heart of Texas. That was the voice of my friend, Mr. Brad L., that you heard on the beginning of this here episode, and you are in for a treat. You're going to hear so much more from him in just a moment, but first things first, this here episode is made possible by Gene, Mary Lynn, Laura, and Tim. What you may ask, inquiring minds may ask, what did they do? Well, they went to our humble little website, www.soberspeak.com, maintained by the lovely Mrs. M. And they clicked on the little yellow donate tab. I think it's at the bottom of the page now, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know where it is. But anyway, they, they found it. They clicked on that tab and they made a, a contribution. So thank you so much, Gene, Mary Lynn, Laura, and Tim. This here episode is coming right out to you and we're going to let the rest of the folks listen on in, but mainly it's coming on out to you. All right, if you are out there and you're feeling a little bit of restless, irritable, and discontent, well, we are here to get you back on the beam. We are so glad that you have joined us today. So, I right before I started to record this episode, I got an email. And I'm going to share it with you right now. Hold, hold on. It's a long story. My computers are doing some weird stuff. So I have to reach over here uh, to the right-hand side to get Hold on a second. All right, I'm back. So this email came in. And um, I don't know. It was just one of those things that I thought I should share on the beginning of this episode. Um, and this came in from his mother. Uh, uh, when I say his, um, I, I, let me just read the whole thing. It says, Hey, John M. I have been incarcerated for almost four years now, and I will be getting out in five months. So I'm ready and blessed. My life before prison this time was great. I was living out, out the promise of recovery. I had a great job that I loved. I was a speaker chair for the Rockwell Club in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. My own, I had my own place, bills being paid, relationships restored. However, I wasn't helping the newcomers. I was sponsored, but not sponsoring. Like most of us, I was rushing around trying to fix the, destru- the destruction of the years of alcoholism and not letting it be on God's time. Spiritually unfelt, I went to help 
a young lady that I knew was fighting with the disease of alcoholism. Two days later, I'm waking up in a county jail. Later, I find out I'd be, I'd be going back to prison to do a four-year sentence. It was during COVID and I was broken, and I couldn't accept life on life's terms. Within the first 90 days, a lady came down to, from the administration office and asked if I was Duncan. I said, yes. She said that Nemo says to keep your head up. Nemo was a friend from AA. Right then, I got some relief. Once again, AA was showing up in the darkest places. Through the General Service Office in New York City, we have now set up our registered meetings called Pocket Our Pride. We have the most meetings in Oklahoma in the DOC. Uh, a month later or so, while on the last COVID lockdown, I heard the intercom say, AA in the chapel. There, I met another inmate, uh, and from there, with the help of AA and the volunteers, we developed a registered AA meeting. We have chosen to be part of the International AA Corrections Conference coming March 16th, 2024. We get to be part of another AA Corrections Conference, and I will be able to tell my story via Zoom. That's great, Duncan. With just three other prisoners, one of us, uh, which is being in San Quentin, California, my good friend Marty G, also known as Detroit, got to tell his story briefly. I have been in recovery. I have been in recovery meetings now for going on two decades, and I absolutely love this way of life. Being a knucklehead. I haven't done everything that you all had suggested, hey, me neither, Duncan, uh, and repeatedly ended up in jails or institutions. Coming back to prison after not being in here for 13 years was difficult. It was a culture, sh culture shock from the world of recovery. During the COVID period of prison, I found sober speak in this world of hate and misery. I found hope, home, and love. I used to help record the speakers for Citywide and the Western Club in Oklahoma City. So to hear David G. as Citywide was really cool. Being able to hear Cliff and Lori G. was great. I've had friends really close to Cliff. You have some really amazing speakers on there. But my absolute fav favorite is episode 273 with Marina C. So much passion in her story. I cry every time, especially when her father takes her to her first meeting. Hearing her relationship be restored is moving! Exclamation point. Thank you, John M. The road, your road, means so much. Keep up the good work. Your friend of recovery, Duncan L., uh, he's at the J.H. Lilly Correctional Center in uh, Bowley, Oklahoma. <sighs> that just meant so much to me. Uh, and thank you again for your mom sending in that message. Marsha, we really appreciate you forwarding that on. And as you know, I copied everyone who was mentioned in that email, um, and they responded to it. And they're very grateful that they can be a small part of your journey. I'm very grateful that I can be a small part of your journey, Duncan. Keep on keeping on, my friend. And thank you so much for writing in. I very, very much appreciate it. But, but I, so, and this is just a side note. When you were talking about both Nemo and, uh, <laughs> The gentleman known as Detroit. I was wish I was thinking, you know, I should have my own nickname. And my daughter reminded me that we had come up with a rapper name for me at one point, and it is Little Little L I L Ginge. 
G-I-N-G. The ging is because of the, <laughs> the whole red hair thing. So, I mean, you know what? Yeah, and th- there was a guy that went to our group once, and his name was Bruno. And I always thought, hey, as opposed to John M., can I have something? Can I be known as somebody like Bruno? But maybe from here on out, I should be known as Little Little Ginge. I'm going to have to learn how to say <laughs> to say my name first, though. That little, that little is, I don't know, it's tough, it's, it's tough to say, but, but nonetheless. <laughs> God bless you, Duncan. Uh, God bless your family. Once again, thank you, Marcia, for sending that in. And uh, you are in our prayers, and hopefully our paths will all cross one day soon, Mr. Duncan. Thanks for writing it in. All right, now on to our featured guest of the week. Um, some people call him Cowboy Brad. Uh, some people call him just Brad L. Uh, I know his uh, one of his sponsees, Chris S., who I've had on the show many, many times, calls him Spiritual Brad. You call him whatever you want, but just don't call him late for dinner. <laughs> That was a good one. But nonetheless, um, <laughs> this is Mr. Brad L. from Santa Monica, California. The beautiful Santa Monica, California. This here episode is called Physical, Emotional, and Spiritual Sobriety. Brad is just such a gentle jo- uh, gentle soul, and I enjoy his vibe, just chatting with him. We've had many conversations off the mic. Uh, uh, Brad has given me a very good input in my life and how to handle search- certain situations. I love him to, de- bit to death. Uh, something to note, though, this is the first time, first time ever in the history of Sober Speak. The seagulls have made an appearance on an episode. So yes, you will hear seagulls from his place out in uh, Santa Monica. We talk about dealing with physical pain and sobriety, conscious contact with God and what that looks like for Brad, uh, meditation, seeking outside help in Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, being awake And what that means, uh, what we can learn from the animals as Grad grew up, not brew up, (laughs) he may have brewed up too, I don't know, uh, on a ranch uh, and has practiced uh, equine therapy and what he has learned from dealing with horses and other animals on the farm and all that farm stuff. Uh, (laughs) We talk about Brad's time with the horse whisperers, that, that, that word is hard to say. Whisperers. Uh, anyway, a couple of hard words I'm trying, uh, having a hard time saying here. But nonetheless, uh, we cover that and much, much more with the one and only Brad L. And we will have plenty of listener feedback at the end of this here episode. Enjoy, Brad L. Um... Okay, everybody. So we are back again with a previous guest, Mr. Brad L. So Brad, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and introduce yourself, give your sobriety, and tell people what beautiful corner of the world that you live in, please. What was the first part? Just tell them where I'm at. What did you yeah, say? Sobriety? Give, so go ahead and introduce, give, give them your, your name. <laughs> Your sobriety uh-huh. date, if you want, and sobriety. where you live. Uh, Brad L. I'm originally from Nebraska, but I live in Southern California, Santa Monica, California, and I'm looking at the ocean right now. And uh, my sobriety date is March 7th, 1987. And um, yeah, it was good to be here. It's good to see you again. You know, good we really have- had a great conversation last time. And I was we did. talking to you. We did. There was some, I, I got one post. It was from, it was on Instagram. Uh, some lady posted out there. She said, love this episode. And then she said, I listened to it four times back to back. And Brad, I absolutely love you, my friend, but I don't know if I could listen to it four times <laughs> back to back. <laughs> I know, like, I don't like my girlfriends here and I don't like talking in front of her because I'm thinking like you're hearing this stuff over and over and over again, you know, 
<laughs> can she hear me back there? No, she's. A, I don't think she's tuned in to me at all. I don't think she can hear me at all. She's got okay. Well, yeah, I can see her. So anyway, oh, tell her go. I said hi. Turn around. You... Tell her I said hi. Say hello to me. Yeah, thanks, Karen. <laughs> This guy finally gets the ghost. <laughs> like, what is that thing that's flying? And then you looked at your thing. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, that's, that's all okay. part of me. You got to improv this a little bit, John. Yeah, yeah, right. That's, that's the fun. <laughs> the reason part. I was saying that I was kind of hinting because she was sitting behind me. <laughs> I told her when I start this, can you leave the room? <laughs> <laughs> it is oh. interesting because some of this we've said over and over, but you know. This, this spiritual way of life that we've kind of lived, it is really basic, but there's there's so many different ways that we come at it. And, you know, I was just reading this morning, which I found fascinating, and I didn't know. And I uh, maybe I can read it to you. Yeah. This is from Dr. – this is from Bill Wilson. Um, he said, I and I sort of depended on Bob to get me into heaven. Bob was far ahead of me in that sort of activity. I was always rushing around talking, organizing, and teaching kindergarten. I never grew up myself. Mm. Because he was talking about all the different books that Bob was reading and all the different religions. He studied so many different things. And I really got from Bill some of his teachings later on that we really have, we have an amazing outline for sobriety. I mean, we really do. We got a gift. But it just opens the door to spirituality. It's up to do. It's up to us after that. That's right. Uh, didn't Bill say something like? I think he was making a reference to it that Alcoholics Anonymous is a, a spiritual kindergarten. Spiritual kindergarten. Yeah. And that's no. And that's no knock on Alcoholics Anonymous. Not at all. No. Um, but I, I always thought that was so good. All right. So I let's. <clears throat> So, uh, by the way, how much did you pay that lady to write that uh, Instagram post? Did, did you more than 20 bucks? <laughs> yeah, a little more than 20, 25, you know. <laughs> so I was in a conversation with you the other day. As you know, we've had past our, our past episode, post our past episode that we recorded together. We've yeah. had a lot of different conversations uh, mm-hmm. We've talked about a lot of different things. You've helped me tremendously. Um, I really felt drawn to you. And so we, we, we've had a lot of conversations about being aware, staying in the now, how to handle challenges in life, et cetera. But there was one last conversation we had, and I think my cell phone cut off, cut off or something like that. Um, but I was asking you about how you were doing and you told me that I, I think you said something to the effect of, I may have to have a couple of hips replaced. Am I, am I accurate on that? Yes, you are. I just investigated that two weeks ago. Finally, it took me a while to get it done, but yeah, it looks like I'm going to have to get them both to finally get them done. And at the same time. Yeah. You know, it's a complete, I'm glad I've waited. Because it's a different operation than it was just two, three years ago. So before the incision was maybe, I'm just making a number 12, 14 inches. Now it's four inches. Mm -hmm. The recovery time is two to three weeks. They can do them both at the same time in two hours. But what you're referring to when we're talking about that is it finally got to a place, John, is such a metaphor for a recovery. I was walking around, I was working with some horses and I was walking around and my adductors get so tight, I can barely walk. And I was in so much pain. I just went, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. I can't do it anymore. I've been in so much pain. I just can't go any further. So I had to go investigate another way, just like sobriety. You know, I finally got too much. So, but I've kind of, I was actually talking to my girlfriend about it. You know, my parents were country. I mean, that's country, country people. They're all farmer, ranchers, cattle feeders. They lived through some hardships and we just, we just kept moving no matter what happened. If you were sick, you still fed cattle. You had to go out and feed. You had to go do certain things, you know, injuries. I just learned to kind of, you kind of muscled it up and you kept going. And I don't know if that really has to do with character as much as, Well, maybe because I learned it from my family, but what did help me a lot is what I realized is I could not focus on the pain. And what I mean by that is if I get dialed in on the pain, 
then it gets really, it can get big. And it's happened a few times at night. And I have to get in this place, and you may call it meditation, whatever you want to call it, but in this place where I can kind of separate from the pain. Instead of saying, I'm in pain, there's a feeling of pain passing through me, two different states. Mm. So I get in this place of laying in my bed and, and just trying to be aware and, and doing some breathing exercises that I've learned myself. And just being aware of my weight of my body in the bed, starting at my ankles and working all the way up to my head. And a lot of times I can fall asleep. Um, and I've just really learned how to, and it's such a great thing because the same techniques that I learned to separate from thoughts, I've learned to separate from pain. Okay. But the so same thing they talk about pain management. So, yeah. So let's dive into that a little bit. Uh, you know, you're, you're kind of blending both spirituality, uh, pain management, and life on life's terms, I guess, uh, all, all together. So where did you learn these particular techniques, like the breathing techniques? And I mean, have you? is it all self-taught? Is it just a kind of a, a combination of things you've learned throughout the years? You know, I investigated a lot of different people. And I went to different places and took meditation classes. But, you know, I worked in a mental hospital for quite a while. I'll back up for a second. And I worked in a mental hospital, lockup hospital, lockup ward. So, John, we had people there that they meditated every day, some of the patients. And I can tell you what happens when a mentally ill person meditates or crazy person. You have a very quiet, crazy person. And so what happens is all you have to do is come along and push it a little bit and out it comes again. And I really, I noticed that because I noticed several people would meditate in there. And for me, a lot of this I had learned about how do I do, I was working with patients and they would get into, they'd get triggered. And I do not where, know where this came from, but I had been doing some reading, but I still don't know where it came from. But I'd always known that the answer is the problem is the way I think, so I can't think my way out of it. It's in the absence of thought. And a gift that I had gotten, and we all kind of a little bit aware of that I'm really never present. I'm always some other place. So I used to get the patients to really go through like describing what's in the room, um, describing their hands to me, describing um, physical things in the room. And it would take him out of that thought process and get him grounded in the moment. And pretty soon, all their troubles were gone. And I really took note of that. Now, I wish I could do that all the time, but I do do that quite a bit, especially when I'm starting to, let's say we get angered or disturbed. I kind of sit back and just see what is this disturbance? And then I try to get grounded back in the moment again. Um so give me an example of that. Like, what would the thought process be when you're going through something like that? There's when you're no thought process. It's the absence of that, brother. Okay. Well. So, so what I mean is, is the, it's I, because I found myself, when I first started this journey out here in California, there was a gentleman named Chuck C. And I used to hear him speak and I thought, you know, he sounded different than everyone else. And he talked about God differently than everyone else. I don't know if you'd noticed that, but he was just a little bit different. So I was wondering, what is what was he doing? And I found out he was really involved with a church called Science of Mind by Ernest Holmes. And it was down, and there was one down in Redondo Beach. And my first sponsor was, was down there. And I started going down there to check it out. And I was always trying to find a different way to think. But what I realized was when I walk into a room or I get a place where I'm uncomfortable, what I'll start to do is place things in the room. Just notice, just to notice where my body's at, to notice that there's a light, there's a window, it's half open, there's a TV that's black, there's a green water bottle, my right foot's extended out, noticing the tone of my voice. And I really try to look up and around. There was a really great horse trainer out in San Inez, California. Her name was Sandy Collier. And I was out there riding one time and she said, Brad, you need to look up and around. And when I did that, I was riding with her. When I looked up around, I realized, oh my gosh, there's all this life going on. I wasn't even aware of it and it kind of snapped me out of what I was doing. 
when I was in New York City one time, I was walking around and I noticed everybody was kind of walking around in a daze. They weren't really looking up and around. So my gaze, I had to get my gaze up. And you'll see this in meetings. You know, when you see that person in a meeting and they've got their head down looking at their feet, you know they're on their way down the rabbit hole. So part of that technique is knowing where my physical body is at. That's a really great technique. Also, for me, there's exercises that I sit up, like knowing, knowing my foot hit the ground when I get out of bed in the morning. For me, that's the most amazing meditation because I'm really getting grounded in the present moment. That doesn't take thought. Thinking and awareness are two different states. A state of awareness is different than a state of thought. And awareness is in that place where I'm free. And and you're going to, it mentioned something about talking about animals and that type of thing. And that's where I really learned some of this. So I set up different exercises. One of those is, is when I get out of bed in the morning, to know that my foot hit the ground and then start to be aware of what my inner state is. What's going on with me today? And then when I walk to the coffee pot, when I'm not a coffee pot, I have an espresso machine. (laughs) When I'm walking to the espresso machine, just to really be aware and present in there was I'm going up to the espresso machine. Know that I'm opening the refrigerator. Know that I'm pulling out the milk. Know that I'm grinding the coffee. And then sometimes I'll catch myself, and lately there's been a, um, a situation from the past that keeps coming up, and I'll be right in the minute where I think I'm going to tell that person off from two years ago, where that comes from, I don't know. And I'll go, oh, my God, God help me, and I get right back to what I'm doing. Look what I'm doing to myself. That person isn't doing anything to me. That's me doing it to me. Because in our book, in Alcoholics Anonymous, it says that we don't remove those character defects, that we have to have God remove those. And I found that's the case. The tough part about it is, do I want to let go of them? Mm. Yeah. You mentioned to me once that you meditate, and now I can see why, because of what you do, with your eyes open, which is... You know, I mean, not everyone does it that way, uh, but you do it for what reason? To get grounded, like you were saying? But I also, I play with it. I do a lot of different things. You know, sometimes when I was especially listening to speakers, different times or listening to something on the internet, I'll close my eyes. Sometimes when I get here in the morning, I'll close my eyes. And it was powerful about that. And I've learned this from doing a lot of groups, equine groups, is to listen to, not listen to what they're saying, but listen to how they're saying it. You know, I've even myself, I've talked about God, but my voice was telling me, I was talking about God and faith, but my voice was telling me anxiety and fear. Hmm. You follow me by that? My voice had anxiety and fear in it. So a lot of times I'll do that. Um, And my, when I'm doing that, when I sit down in the chair, First thing I'll do is is I'll sit down and get comfortable, and I like to cut my cup my right hand into my left hand, and I'll just scan my body fairly quickly, starting at my feet and going to the top of my head, so I get really connected to my body. Then I'll probably go into maybe a traditional meditation, but a lot of times I'll just I'm looking out at the ocean right now here in Santa Monica Bay, and sometimes early in the morning I'll just sit here. And, and watch to see what thoughts come up. Don't change them at all. Just watch to see what comes up. The cool part about that is, like right now, I can see way out. I'm a little too far north to see Catalina, but I can see a long ways out in the ocean right now. What I realized is the more watchful I am of thoughts, I can catch them way off in the distance and stop them. Mm -hmm. Can I do that all the time? No. But it's a really good thing because what I found for me, especially in early sobriety, you know, these fears and all these thoughts would take me and grab me and drag me all over, you know, all over the place. And I couldn't get free of them. Gradually over time, I was able to get free of them. Now I can catch them from a long ways away before they can get a hold of me. So I realized I can't stop the thoughts. I'm not responsible for the thoughts. I'm responsible for the thinking. Do I have this down, John? No. I don't, but I know that it works. You know why? Because I've got freedom that I've never had before. And um, when I'm in that place, 
is the only time I really sense that there's something higher than Brad. So you have mentioned it a couple times already, just kind of briefly, but I want to kind of dive into it a little bit more. You are involved. So in fact, uh, Chris S who's been on this podcast many times, who, you know, very well, yeah. uh, yeah, I'm going to see him next week. Oh, really? What are y'all doing? He's coming out here. He's doing a workshop up in Santa Barbara. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I think he told me about that. Isn't Bill C, uh, yeah. put yeah. it on or something like that. Yeah. That's great. Um, so Gosh, I wish I was there to record it. Now I'm thinking of it, but you know, oh well, maybe next time. So Chris S. Uh, knew that I was recording with you and he suggested that I should talk to you about like a subject matter called, you know, what we can learn from animals. Uh, you've been around animals all your life. You do equine therapy. Right. And we talked about this briefly on the phone one day. And, and I told you that, well, you said something to the effect of you can learn a lot about people from how they behave around horses. Right. Yeah. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, if I like, I, I, I grew up in apartments, right? And never with a single mom, never had any sort of pets whatsoever. And, and I've just never been great with animals. Like, and I don't know what I would do around a horse. And I'm, I'm afraid I would like be a fraud, like coming around a horse. In front well, of there you. you go. You just said it though. What? So I'm, when I'm working with people and horses. And by the way, the, l l let me set this yeah. up. So when people come to you, do they come to you for therapy with the horses? And what's the intent when, when you're working with people? My intent, it's called, I call it an equine experience. But what I'm trying to do is let them be more aware of what their behaviors are to see what goes on inside them, how they act in real time. Because listen, the, the biggest stranger right now between me and you isn't you, it's me. It's very hard and difficult to see myself in real time. So part of that gives me an opportunity, opportunity to see how they interact with an animal. Because in my opinion, the way that you do anything is the way that you do everything. So I just sit back and watch and listen to what they say, what the words come out of their mouth, what they say about the horse, what they say about themselves and relationship to the horse will tell me how they respond, interact in relationships. Then after that, there is something really special about nature and animals. There's something special about it. And then we work on getting connection. And, and most of the time, matter of fact, 100% of the time, when they're connected to that animal, all the problems that they came into that session with are gone. And that's when I realized this really is about conscious contact. And, and I'll back up, John, you said it, and I so resonate with this. And this, I'll put part of this on me, but you said, I would feel like a fraud. So I would look at that and I bring that going, wait a minute, come back here, John. Does that happen to you much? Are you telling yourself that you're a fraud in other areas? Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah, that's why that's where yeah. I would start to look, because a lot of times, not a lot of times, most of the time, it's really great people when they're telling me about the horse. They told me about themselves. I can't tell you how many times people have said, yeah, the horse is really anxious. And I'm going, that horse is about ready to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> it's not anxious. And, and I'll point out to him and, and there's something else about being in nature that I've worked with some pretty rough populations, you know, some gang kids. I worked with the homeless kids down in Venice. If I would push subjects like that in a room and say, hey, are you talking about the horse? Or are you talking about yourself? They would probably tell me F you and walk away. There's something about the setting of being outside, being in nature and being in the horse that I'm allowed to say things that I couldn't say in other situations. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, some of that has to do with the cowboy hat and the horse <laughs> and everything, because everybody has an image of the cowboy, you know, and a horse. But um, that's kind of how I, how I go about it. The Santa Monica cowboy. Yeah. I always wanted to be a cowboy as a little boy. <laughs> and now throughout the United States, I'm known as Cowboy Brad in AA meetings. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Sometimes I still kind of cringe at that, but I, it's funny because I always wanted to be a cowboy and then I cringe at the saying. So it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So cowboy Brad, another thing I wanted to talk to you about, well, well first I, I, I think there's more there with the equine therapy and the, and yeah. the animals and what we learn from animals. So in general, I, I mean, you you've told you told me a story once also I, I don't think it was on the podcast we were just talking on the phone and you said that oh i know what you said you said that there's a difference between doing the steps and being in meetings and how you equated that to your equine life if you will is that you would notice that some people would say yeah they're great yes. writers but yeah. then you continue the story. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> the, a lot of people have seen the movie The Horse Whisperer. And I was very blessed and my life's been very good that I had a chance to spend time around the three men that that movie was about. And what was interesting, one of his names is Buck. And there's a great documentary out there called Buck. If you get a chance, John, watch it. And Buck's an acquaintance of mine. You know, I talk to him periodically. Um but what I noticed is he got very famous in, from this documentary. So he had a certain hat. He uses a flag. He had books. He had a certain saddle. He had certain shaps. He had a certain way he talks. And, and I did a clinic right after his first, that documentary came out, and it was pretty popular. And I was in the clinic, and listen, I'm, I'm probably, I might be, I'm sure I'm a little bit above average. And I was listening to the people talk, and a lot of people had his hat, they had his shafts, they had his saddle, they had all the stuff. And I was listening to him talk, and I was like, wow, these people really know. Later on, we had to do some activities. And there was probably 30 people in the morning class, 30 people in the evening class, and maybe 100 people watching. And I went, oh my gosh, not that I, I'm not saying that I can do it all, but I realized not all of them, very few of them could actually do it. Mm -hmm. They could talk about it. They had the right outfit. They'd read the book. They had the flag. But to really do it, no, there was maybe three, maybe four. And the gap between them and Buck was gigantic. And so I find that kind of sobriety sometimes. You know, we kind of forget that going to a meeting is not a step. I love meetings. But there's more to this. It's about how do I really practice living these things in real time? Can I really practice it? Because the biggest struggle for all men is that for me, what I've noticed is, is my public self and do my private self match? There's one way of talking about these spiritual things in a meeting, but can I really follow through when the pressures build up out there in real time? So um, go ahead. And you, you also told me about a guy that you knew, uh, he kind of, he, he was a high profile-ish kind of guy, uh, the son of somebody. And he was, uh, you, he, he had kind of let on, or you were under the impression that he knew how to. Oh, yes. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Super, super prominent family. Good. Really great guy. Um struggled in his sobriety and he had been on um, world class he was an amateur nationally ranked amateur rider hunter jumper or hunter i should say hunter and we went to go gather cattle out here a friend of mine had the lease of land at the very end of the malibu mountains overlooking uh ventura in that area by oxnard so I said, do you want to go along? And I, he said, sure. So we got a horse. I loaded up in the trailer. When we got out, I realized that we went to go ride. And oh, my gosh, he had no idea what he was doing out there. He could do this thing. He could jump a house. Well, maybe not a house. Hunters don't jump that high. But he really didn't know how to handle a horse out there. He was great in the arena. And I think is where I was talking about. In the arena, he could do a lot. Once you took away the training wheels that are out in the hills, because you're out there and we're going up and down hills that you would go, man, that horse can't make that. He was completely lost to the point where I kind of had to find a place for him to be safe so we could get the work done. And that's nothing against him, but it's just like the spiritual journey. I guess the, the lesson to that would be is it's much easier to talk about spiritual matters 
than to really live them. Hmm. My observation about yeah. myself. Yeah, yeah, and likewise, likewise. Um, I also want to talk to you a little bit about outside help and what you may, when I say outside help, you know, just go into, I don't know, professionals, uh, right. talking to, you know, because there's a, at least when, you know, when you and I got sober, especially there was kind of a stigma about going to any it's sort of counselor thing. or taking any sort of medicine yeah. or whatever. You weren't really living in the moment or whatever the case may be. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, can, do you mind if I back up to the animal nature? Not at all. Because there's some really great things to really see about that. So I was at a meeting up in Dukes, Malibu this morning at 7 a.m. or 7.15. And some dolphins came by. Everyone in the room made comments and there was the oohs and ahs. And everyone was so drawn to that. And they're just being dolphins. And what I realized for me, sobriety isn't just about being sober. It's about getting back to my natural state. And that natural state for me is relaxation. Because animals, if you notice them, they are just relaxed. There'll be scary things that'll come up and they'll go into a panic. Excuse me, but not long after that, like horses, they'll go, oh my gosh, what is that? And they'll go, oh, nothing. And they can go right back to relaxing like nothing ever happened. And for me, a lot of that, what happened is when I started to notice that, you know, animals until we domesticate them, if you were, work with wild Mustangs, I did a little bit with them and I got a chance to start one, is that like a Mustang, when you approach a Mustang in a pen, you everything movement means something because that horse isn't thinking about you, he's watching you. And he's not only watching you, he's aware of what's going on around him. His awareness goes out a long ways. As we domesticate animals and horses, we kind of dull down their senses. We've been kind of domesticated. We've dulled, dulled down our senses. Those animals in the wild or wild dogs, their awareness, if anything moves in the distance, they notice it. Especially a horse that being a prey animal, to stay alive, he has to be aware of what's going around him. And I, for me, I really noticed that like when I domesticated, there's a friend of mine had a lab and you could walk by and that lab wouldn't even know it. Wild dogs, that doesn't happen. They know pretty much everything that's going around them. They're, they are so tuned in like horses. They know they can listen two different directions. They have a sense of smell. They can feel and see everything. And for me, what I've learned in, is when I'm in that state of relaxation, it says in our book, we relax and take it easy. We do not struggle. We cease to fight everyone and everything, which is also interesting. I think I told you, I looked up how it was in the Bible. It says, be still and know that I am God. Do you know what the term be still, that origin of be still means? What? Stop fighting and cease striving. Cease fighting and cease striving. That's what the origin of be still meant. Makes sense, right? Because I thought it was just don't move, be really still, and you're in touch with God. It's like, stop striving, stop fighting, and God, you're right there. We're connected to it. And so nature is such a great thing about that because what I realized, and I think we talked about this, is I was up in Montana one time, and I was looking over this most beautiful view. And it really hit me how nature is always going forward. It's always changing, but it's always right now. It never goes back in time. It never goes forward in time. It's always right here, right now. And there's such freedom from that because for me, what I've learned in my contact with God is that is reality. When I'm here right now, just like nature, that means I'm connected to reality. And for me, reality and God are the very same thing. And God's always there, but I'm always disconnected because I'm not aware of it. And when I slow down enough, we talk about slow down, right? We pause. When I can pause just a little bit and get connected to that space, that because God's in that pause, that's when I can allow something else to live my life for me. Because as it says in the book, I want to learn how to get in this flow. And with horses, even working with horses, I can tell you the minute I tense, it's over. If they're bucking and you're tense, you ain't going to stay on. 
I think I told you this when I was a kid. Well, first of all, I want to ask yeah. you a question real quick. When you are working with somebody in equine therapy and they've never been around a horse before, yeah, do you throw a Mustang in the ring, a wild no. Mustang? <laughs> no, that wouldn't work. <laughs> that wouldn't work. The horses I have, they're pretty quiet. Although I'll work with any horse that's out there because most horses, unless there's something really wrong with them, they're not going to try to take the human out. Yeah. They're not going to do that. But no, I don't, I don't do that. And I told you this before, the only horse I've ever been on was a Shetland pony when I was a little kid, <laughs> when I was like five or six, and, and it, it bucked me. And they said, that, that, that pony's never bucked anybody. <laughs> I've never gotten back on. But I don't know, I'll have to come out to your ranch someday and see if I can uh, get over that uh, fear there. You know, those horses know who can support them and who can't. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty That's interesting. very interesting. But I mean, I was just five or six, but I must have been kind of, I'm sure I was scared, tensed up. But, well, you know. what happens is I saw this happen on my horse the other day. Somebody was riding, you know, riding her around and they went to go and they tensed up and they had her going real fast and she kind of kicked up, wasn't a big thing. They just didn't know. She went into this frantic mode of like, what are they doing? What's going on? And what also is interesting, I let a lot of beginner people ride her, which means they don't know how to support her. They're riding. When I'm riding, I'm not riding. These are my, they're not her feet. They're my feet. So I know how to support her so she feels more comfortable. And there's a lot of metaphors in there too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking while we while I'm you know, I I've done a lot of these interviews as you know. And they all have kind of a different kind of tone to them and a different sort of feel and a vibe. While I'm talking to you, I notice myself several times just closing my eyes and taking a deep breath and getting more into the now and i'm hoping that's what others will feel too when they're actually uh listening to this uh, episode guess what what i i'm doing the same thing right along with you i mean yeah Good. sometimes i notice i get going a little fast and i go slow it down and I, and I really do this a lot john i try to be aware of my voice mm -hmm. it's a game changer all right, let's turn. Let's uh, switch gears here a little bit. Go back Medication. to what I was. Uh, well, no, actually, the the outside help. Yes, uh, we talked about that earlier. What What is your thought on that? I, I think you've been in that world. Like, like, yeah, you, you actually practice in some sort of form or fashion right. outside help, right? My first job in sobriety was working in a mental hospital on the corner of Barrington Olympic in Los Angeles. Community Psychiatric Centers of America, CPC Westwood was where I worked. <clears throat> and that was one of my first jobs. And um, when I first got sober, there was a lot of um, um, opinions on outside help and therapists and that type of thing. And listen, Bill went to his sponsor was Father Dowling. So for me, that's outside help. And there's a lot of people that are really, really talented at giving you feedback, especially when Bill was talking about emotional sobriety. A lot of me, so for, this is my opinion, also my experience has been you have so, uh, physical sobriety, you have emotional sobriety, then you have spiritual sobriety. The emotional sobriety, I've just started to get in touch of, you know, what emotions and how I really operate in real time. The answer to the way out of that is through spiritual sobriety. But there's therapists out there that are really talented at being able to pinpoint and telling you, just like when you said, I feel like a fraud. Mm -hmm. They're able to get right to what's going on, what, what they hear, what they see when you're speaking. That's a talent. And, and that's something that has to be learned. And uh, there's a lot of people, including myself, that have come in AA. Their big thing right now is trauma. And um, there are some people that I've met in AA and 12-step that have really been in some amazing traumatic situations. Myself, I've been in some really traumatic situations when I was a little boy, and I didn't know how to get out of them. And an inventory and just talking to a sponsor, that's a lot to 
get help with that. And um, to get somebody that's talented that can kind of walk you through understanding the trauma and then helping you out, helping you find a way out of it is so valuable. There's nothing better than that. <clears throat> There's a big thing now called psilocybin. Have you heard about the psilocybin treatment? Yeah, is that the mushrooms things? Yeah. yeah. So I met a doctor on the East Coast. I think he passed away. But he said something really great. He said there's something to this, the psilocybin. And, and I just came up. It was a thought I had when you were talking before, John. But what was interesting is it really will help you identify. But he said, I've done hundreds of these. But where most therapists and psychologists that do this, where they miss it, that their clients aren't coming into that treatment with a real strong practice of meditation and mindfulness. That they're really not going to get the benefits. Otherwise, it's just kind of a one and done. You're going to get a little something and you're going to go back. He had people go, you really have to work at meditation and mindfulness before you can come in. Like there's a ayahuasca treatment. Have you heard of that? I have. A friend of mine actually goes down to the Amazon and met a shaman down there. So before you could do the ayahuasca, you had to spend a year with him. You just couldn't go do the ayahuasca. He thought that was not fair to the person. There's really a lot of training they have to do to get to that point. And uh, what does that have to do with the ask? Well, it's kind of outside help. But I, I think there's a real benefit to it. Um, and I actually, to be honest with you, I think it's a part where a lot of people in sobri sobriety miss it. We have such an amazing answer for sobriety. We really do. 12 Steps is amazing. But they encourage people to go back in the day to look for outside help. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question completely or not. Yeah, it did answer my question. I appreciate that. Um, you know, Brad, I know that you have a, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a hard stop, but an event that you have to be to uh, after this. I don't want to be cognizant of that. Uh, and I, yeah. You know, yeah, and this has just really been, uh, I, you know, I, I, I love this. Uh, one more subject I want to bring up with you, okay? Okay. Being awake like we have we have talked about that you've sent me uh, emails on that i have practiced that being awake is tough to do sometimes if you will yeah. um but talk to me about what you think of when you think of being awake that's a great question but it's not something i think about it's something i see is something completely different. My first few years of sobriety were a struggle. Those exercises, what I call them exercises, um, of getting out of bed, knowing that I was going through my door. There was an exercise someone gave me, and I think I said this on your last podcast, maybe at dinner, we talked in private, that they said, you know, I talked about meditation and my meditation practice, and I asked him what he did, and he said, I've been doing it the whole time we've been talking. There's something different about that man. And he said, just go see what it's like for you just to be aware of yourself walking out your door of your house every time you walk out. Do that for a week. I can't tell you how many times I walked out that door, A, got to my truck and went, oh, I forgot, or down the road and didn't even think about it because I'm always someplace else. There was a phrase, there was a teacher named Gurdjieff and um, you remember the movie Groundhog Day? Yes. <laughs> With Bill Murray? They were all big Gurdjieff followers. But Gurdjieff used to say, man is asleep dreaming, he's awake. And I know that to be true, that I'm not really awake in this moment. I was always thinking about the next. Part of my meditation is learning how to live without a next. But I had to awaken to a reality, to this very present reality moment right now. And that's not something I can think about. That's something that I go to a place of awareness. That's why it's so hard to describe. The tough part about it, we have this dis-ease of the mind that has been using us for a really long time. And as longer we stay sober, hopefully we're able to kind of get some distance between you and 
thoughts so I can live in this place of peaceful awareness. I mean, there's a right place for thinking, you know, practical thought, like how do I fix my truck? How do I bake cakes? I don't bake cakes, but if I was going to have to bake a cake, I'd have to think about that. But I don't have to live in the plan because for me, a big life isn't something that I do. A big life I can do right now. I thought a big life was something I was doing, all these activities. And what I learned was I didn't love life. I loved activities. When I have a big life, I am so dialed in to where I know the breeze is coming through the window. And in this place of awareness, and that's where to have a conscious contact with God, I realized I have to be conscious and aware. Mm. And the only answer, the only problem has ever been is conscious, unconscious separation. Because I wasn't conscious and aware of me going through the door. And the only answer to all my problems has been conscious contact. And what I mean by that is, you know, Bob, when he was talking about first things first, that was seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all else will be added unto you. For me, that's not a Christian thing. That's a biblical thing. For me, the kingdom of God is in this moment, in this reality right now. So when a problem comes up, I don't try to think my way out. I just try to go back to where are my feet are at. Notice that maybe I have tension in the back of my neck and relaxing. Just knowing where I'm at and allowing the universe to God to take care of everything because it's always worked out. My job is just to say, God help me and then leave it alone. Don't try because what the beginning, I used to say, God help me. And then I go right back to thinking about it. Now it's like a post-it, God help me deal with this and go right back to this place of awareness. Does that make sense? It does. And as you know. Not easy to do. Right, it's not easy to do. But that's okay. But that's what practice, and getting sober is not easy to do. Eckhart Tolle, there was a man, I got a chance to meet him. A friend of mine set it up to go there, and, and I was in a small group. And he said something to the fact, and there was also another teacher, Vernon Howard, that really blew my doors off. But they would say, don't try to stay in the moment. Just catch yourself not in the moment, because that's really going to create awareness. Some of the writings I talked to you is just to be aware of your existence. Going through the day, just know that you're existing right now. That doesn't take thought. There's a difference between thought and awareness. Those are completely two different things. And the beauty thing about that is the good news and bad news. You can read about that and talk about it, but experience it. Every individual has to go do it themselves. Tough part about it is what I found for myself is I always wanted somebody else to do this for me and they can't. This journey in the beginning, you alone can do it, but you can't do it alone. That's so true when we get sober, but there's at a certain point I kind of got to go solo and I've got to find my way to connect to God. That's kind of a solo thing. You know, I can't go on your, your guidance of God. I got to find mine. That's the beauty I love of 12 step. You know, I think I hear seagulls in the background. Do I not? You do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is probably. I'm so lucky, man. <laughs> That's I'm like a so first for sober Santa speed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is. A I think they're saying. I think I hear them saying, "John M." I think that was a great episode. It may be time yeah. to wrap it up. <laughs> okay. Oh well, yeah, because my battery's dying too. All right. So listen, Brad. This has been great. I'm going to go ahead and read from page 164. Uh, wrap us up. Oh man, that is. I'm going to, and I'm going to have to go back and listen to this one. Uh, I, I don't know if I'll listen to it four times in a row, but I definitely listen to it. <laughs> I'm going to question you. I'm going to question your mental health if you do. <laughs> Page 164 from the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous says, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit. And you will surely meet some of us like me and Brad L., Cowboy Brad, as you trudge the road of happy destiny, may mm. God bless you and keep you.
Until then, once again, my friend, thank you so much for Thanks joining me it. today. It's really good to see you. Let's connect again soon, okay? Sounds good. Thank you again, Mr. Brad L. Remember now, we don't want you sharing your gossip or your toothbrush or your STD, but we would love for you to pause your device and share that episode with a friend or family member. It may be just what they need today. If you have any comments about either that episode or any of our guests, go ahead and write, or you just want to write me a note for whatever reason. And, you know, cause sometimes I get the, you know, John M sucks emails. Uh, those are always fun, but nonetheless, uh, if you want to write me, uh, I'm at John J O H N at sober com. We would love to hear from you now on to a little bit of listener feedback maria writes in and she says hello now this is maria who has been on the pod uh, a couple three times uh in the past uh she has some episodes oh gosh one was a uh, i thought being a mom i thought uh, oh gosh something about a mom in the episode but anyway, if you need to know what what episode she's on because I, I i can't remember it right off the top of my head um but uh, anyway, she's writing in here because she had some stuff going on in New York City. She says, hi, John. I just wanted you to know that I am here in New York City helping a loved one recover from a surgery. While here, I've also been able to connect with Kelly. I remember Kelly, a struggling listener who reached out to you in August of 2022. She says, I never actually knew the whole story until last night, but she shared with a group of people that she, quote, found this amazing podcast with amazing people, all of them like circuit speakers, and they all spoke to her, unquote. Uh, she listened nonstop while she tried to find her way to AA and says that Sober Speak saved her life. That's very kind. Um Anyway, I'm I'm glad we're able to be part of your journey here, Kelly. Uh, and then she says, when she reached out to you, I remember that, you gave her my name and we connected via phone and email. And coincidentally, I was going to be in New York City two weeks later, where we ultimately got to spend some time together over coffee. I've been sponsoring her ever since. That is cool. Well, in fact, <laughs> that's what Maria says next. Amazing how God works, right? Mm -hmm. And as much as she needed me, I needed her. Through Throughout this special, oh, throughout this entire surgical process, she has been a rock to me and is so comforting to know that I have a friend through these trying days. So, yay, sober speak. <laughs> and yay, sis. To get us to this point with the surgery for my family member has been daunting, and I find myself living constantly in the words of St. Francis, AA's 11-step prayer. Over and over again, I pray, God, make me a channel of your peace and comfort and forgiveness, and to understand even when I don't always understand, and to love. It's that simple. She says, side note, as I type this email, I'm actually listening to Sober Speak, and lo and behold, you are reciting the 11-step prayer. I remember that. She says, sparkly and sober. <laughs> Maria. Well, sparkly and sober, Maria. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and she even said, if you want to follow... Um, Maria on <clears throat> Instagram or uh, uh, Facebook, she's got a couple of different handles here. So do you call them handles? I don't know what you call them, whatever. Uh, on Instagram, it's uh, at my sober blessings. And on Facebook, it's at 
sober blessings. Well, sparkly and sober Maria, I hope that all is going well for you up there. Uh, please keep me updated. And uh, I don't know exactly what's going on with your relative, but God bless you. And uh, and God bless Kelly. Uh, hopefully she's listening. And uh, I'm so glad you have found your way with Maria there, Kelly. Melissa writes in and Melissa says, I am a child of God, a mother of a, a two-year-old and a five-year-old and another one on the way. Wow. You have got to be busy. She says, I'm a wife uh, of my husband for seven years and we're both in recovery. I have been sober from alcohol, opiates, and other chemical substances since December 21st of 2017. Me and my family uh, are living in the Lexington, Georgia area for the past six months and previously out of Athens, Georgia. She says, I have not heard any of the speakers yet on your podcast, but as a sister in Christ that is also in recovery for alcohol, uh, they sent me a screenshot of a post Oh, from your uh, super secret Facebook group that was labeled Humility, Dr. Bob's Plaque. I really resonated with the way that he, the way that he has a connection, Dr. Bob, with the father. It was interesting in learning more about Dr. Bob. I've heard some of the story of Bill and his wife, Dr. Bob, and I read into some of the AA book. I'm not really big into following the AA book. Uh, because I guess I've been holding back on relying on anything else besides the Bible, afraid of it uh, becoming an idol. But I'm definitely interested in Dr. Bob's story and his relationship with God. But I was just trying out your Facebook group to see what it was all about. Thank you, Melissa B. Well, thank you, Melissa B. I'm glad you're curious. I'm glad you're in the group. And uh, I'm glad you're open to um, exploring, uh, uh, how do I put this? Just exploring another spiritual, or not another spiritual path. Oh, gosh, I'm fumbling over my words now. Uh, Anyway, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you wrote in. And uh, thank you very much. Coop writes in. And Coop says, hey, John, I haven't been much in touch lately because life gets lifey. Laugh out loud. I've been hearing that a lot in the uh, meetings lately. That's a new phrase. Anyway, he says, so I have a bit of an ask for you again. No problem, Coop. He says, I have visited new. I have visited a newly opened detox center as part of an H&I meeting. For those of you who don't know what H&I is, it's what uh, hospitals and institutions, I believe is what it is. He says, a guy has just arrived and he is from Virginia, specifically uh, in the Lynchburg area. I am trying to set him up with some contacts in that area. If you can be of assistance, I would greatly appreciate it. I am also going to ask the same question in the super secret Facebook group. If anyone reaches out to you, please feel free to share my info. Once again, thanks for all you do. And as always, thanks for bringing Gary K into my life. I love you, brother, and hope to one day finally meet you in person person best wishes coop will love to you my brother as well and i'm sure our paths will cross soon he's talking about gary k who has been on the pod many times and so i guess the main point of this uh, email is if you are in the lynchburg virginia area and you would like to network with somebody getting out of uh detox uh kind of help somebody build a network just email me john j-o-h-n at SoberSpeak.com, and I will get you in touch with Coop, and he will take it from there. Okay, everybody, that there is another episode in the books. Um, I keep doing this one week at a time. Uh, hopefully, we will be back next week. May God bless you and keep you until then. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. Adios. Have a good week.